Right now we have a gentleman by the name of Tim, Tim Holden. He is a son of Piotr, Piotr Zanievski, Polish pilot during World War II in Devon, and he lives in Devon, United Kingdom, is that correct? And, he, uh, and he's going to be talking about uh, Squadron 307, Polish airmen in World War II. Mr. Holden. Right. Thanks very much. Right. It's a great honor to be with you this afternoon. I know I've got the dead spot immediately after lunch, but I greatly appreciate those of you who are sitting here, and I'm sure that everybody else who's outside is going to come running on in. What I would very much like to do is to thank the people who organized this event. I was in touch with them a bit, and I know the tremendous effort that was made to actually set this meeting up. And I think in terms of the information that we've gained here on the first morning of the event has been truly worthwhile. We've seen information come in from numerous different sources to give us a wide variety of aspects that many of us who are interested in the topic may not have considered before. So it's been very, very informative to me and extremely worthwhile. But I think for those of you who are not really aware of the level of input that had to be made by the guys who sacrificed time, and I know that there was a great deal of expenditure involved this event is a tribute to them, and they have my level of, you know, my high level of gratitude for that, and I know that they have yours as well. And I would say, again, that I extend my personal thanks to those who sacrificed that great deal of effort. So, okay, what I was told when I was told I had the opportunity to speak to you, as I was told I had 20 minutes, I was generally ready to give my incredibly long, I think there was a gentleman earlier on who said that he'd go on for only five and a half hours. I've got an eight hour event, if you actually could put up with me for that long, but I reckon I'm gonna get through it in 20 minutes. And what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to talk to you. I'm not going to do any PowerPoint stuff. I think I actually have a minimum of statistics to trouble your minds with. There's no question that the statistics about Poland and about the war are extremely troubling and we know that and we shouldn't ignore it but what I really wish to do is to try to boil this down to describing a couple of very brief events to you that hopefully in one way or another are going to encapsulate something of the power and the spirit that drove the nation through the terrible events of the war. And in fact, the terrible events after the war and the terrible events that preceded the war. And I'm going to actually ask you and draw your imagination to picture in your minds a time of approximately 80 years ago. And I want to tell you the stories from the point of view of a young man. He was 23 years old. He was, in fact, an experienced pilot who 
fought on the first day of the war, and we'll get to that. He was a rebellious young man. He'd run away from home. There had been an altercation in the family, and he was on his way on a great journey. He was a corporal at the beginning of the war. He finished as a sergeant. I obviously wanted him to be an air race and a great hero. He never really talked much about it. When I looked things up later, his name appeared in a few records, and certainly he was no fighter ace, but he played his share in the attrition that was suffered by the enemy. And I think that when he was 15, he ran away from home and it actually had been an argument about the baker's daughter, who was a Jewish girl, as baker's daughters actually often were in Poland. And he had left home, he had joined the army, and they'd actually put him in a test where the test was, could you fly a glider? If they gave you a few instructions and they catapulted you off the side of a hill and if you pushed the lever the wrong way, the nose of the glider went down. If you pulled the lever the right way, the nose of the glider went up. And if you made a clean landing, then you'd pass that section of the course. But the time I want to speak of is a morning in the docks of Casablanca, late in the month of June, when the weather, as it always is in June in Casablanca, is pleasantly warm. It's the summer time of the year, the wind is blowing off the sea, and the year is 1940. And it's late June, and so France has fallen a couple of weeks before in a totally unexpected outcome, because France was not expected to suddenly fall and to capitulate so swiftly. Far to the north of Casablanca, Dunkirk has been evacuated by hundreds of thousands of British and French soldiers. Shortly after that, the western ports of France have seen the flight of many, many more military personnel to England. And those who couldn't reach Britain that way had somehow got to North Africa. And many of these had got to North Africa across the Mediterranean, and they'd boarded trains that roll west across the desert to the port of Casablanca, which is at this stage in late June, still controlled by the French. And there's a bunch of men standing in the docks. The water in the docks is a mixture of a brilliant blue ocean and the sewers of the town. There's an oily film on the water. There's palm trees around the sound of the docks bustling, there's little boats moving in the harbour, servicing the various vessels. And at this section of the wharf, there are two ships that are moored by the dock. One is a large steamer with smoke coming from the funnel, and one is a small blackened vessel that is actually quite low in the water, much smaller than the bigger one that it's docked next to. And that vessel is a coal lighter, a vessel that takes coal out to the coal-fueled ships that are the ships of the time. And standing in front of these ships is a group of several hundred Polish men, maybe as many as 300. They're mainly clad in French uniform. Some are wearing civilian clothing, some are wearing tattered Polish uniforms from the battle of the year before. 
And one of these men standing at the very front holds a red and white flag. And he is standing beside an officer who is in the uniform of the French army, but he's a Polish guy. And he speaks to the group of men in Polish. And the story I'm telling you, as best I was told, is a true story and more or less the words that the officer said were related to me. And I'll give those words to you. The officer said, men, we are here together in a strange country. We've twice fought the Germans before coming here. We fought in the country of our birth. And many of our comrades died when we fought there. We were forced to leave our country. And then we fought for our country again as we fought with the French in France. And more of our comrades died. And because you survived, you stand before me and I thank you. But it seems that as we stand here, the Germans cannot be beaten. And so I must offer you a choice. We have to leave. We have no choice for that. We've got word that the French military and their gendarmes are coming down to the docks right now. And we have commissioned these two ships that stand before you. The big ship sails for Argentina within the hour. If you board that ship, you will not have to fight again. South America is far away enough that maybe the war won't ever go there. I cannot ask you to fight any more. You have died to the last point of endurance. And those of you who are left have fought enough and you're free to go. But listen to me one little bit longer. This smaller ship here offers another choice, the choice to fight again. It also sails within the hour. And this ship will take us 300 kilometers across the sea to Gibraltar. And then from there, we'll be able to get to England. And England is an island where we can fight. And for me, it is the island of last hope. And I'm going there. You don't have to follow me. But if you do, we will go there and fight. And with that, the officer finished his speech. He walked down a narrow gangplank onto that blackened vessel, and he climbed aboard. And the men who were on the wharf gave a great cheer. They followed the officer down that narrow gangplank, and they followed him to the extent that on that little vessel, there was standing room only. And apparently, they cheered. And when the little ship sailed, they sang. And they made their journey towards the island of last hope. Now, my father told me that story for the first time when he was 95 years old. I, being the kind of person I am, asked him if ever he had thought he should have taken the other ship. And he, being more serious than me, said that no, he had chosen to fight to the death, which struck me very powerfully, as I'm sure it strikes you. And in life, um, 
we have to make choices. And often we don't know what we're choosing. When we make choices, we think, oh, I'll do this, or put my money in this bank or that bank. And you don't know what's going to happen. But those guys on the dock had actually seen the Battle of Poland. They'd seen the Battle of France. They knew what they were choosing to do. And it strikes me, I'm in the US only for two days at this point, but I know all about the Alamo and what happened there. And it strikes me that that morning in Casablanca was very similar to the choice that Colonel Travis gave the defenders of the Alamo and that he got a similar response, actually, as those men followed the officer aboard that level. And they didn't think that they would beat the Germans at that stage. Now, we come to the second story, which has a kind of different beginning, because if we move to the 1st of September 1939, a date that has been mentioned a number of times already today, and we go to just outside the city of Krakow, where a temporary airfield has been established so that the Germans do not destroy the 121st Escadrille on the ground, we come to a moment of the highest excitement because the news has come to the squadron that the Germans have crossed the border and the squadron is flying a small fighter plane called a P-11. It's highly effective. It's unfortunately 20 miles an hour in airspeed slower than a German bomber. But the pilots are well trained. They're motivated. They're confident. And they are keen. The ground crews have readied the plane. Everybody has been told, now get into your planes and let's fly. And what my dad told me was that one of the guys, as they were running towards the planes, said, hurry, boys, quick, into the air before the war is over. And that actually was what the expectation was on that morning. It wasn't stupid, it's just what soldiers and flyers and military men believe. They think they're going to win. And they obviously found out that they weren't going to win not long after. And then if we move to that choice in Casablanca after those tremendously devastating defeats, you see the descent of hope and yet the determination to seize that last vestige of hope and fight for that in the face of all that knowledge. Now, I'm then going to take you forward from that morning in 1939. And I'm going to take you 50 years forward to late 1989 to a small town in northeast Poland in the region of Missouri, where there is a hill with a cemetery. And there's a well-kept gate at the entry to the cemetery, and there's an old man climbing the hill. He is the older version 
of one of those young men who was there on the 1st of September, 1939, because he's my dad, and he's walking up a hill alone in a cemetery where he has been directed to that cemetery from the town where he went. It's the first time he's been back to Poland. In, it took 50 years. And he's been in town asking questions, many, many questions. He's been asking about people. And the people in the town have seen this old guy who actually is very smartly dressed, and he's speaking Polish in a strange, old-fashioned kind of vernacular. And he's asking questions like, where's the school? It doesn't seem to be here anymore. Is the baker still around the corner? What about this lady? And why is that building knocked down? And... The people of the town, it's 1989, Poland has just opened up. They're very, very suspicious of him. But finally, someone does him a kindness and gives him a meaningful answer. And he says, look, I know you've got a lot of questions. I think you should go to the cemetery and you should climb to the top of the hill. And the old man climbs the hill. He gets to the top, and there are some trees. They're not particularly big trees. And there are two heaps of stone at the top of the hill, both of them monuments. And he comes to the first monument, and it's got large writing on it, and it commemorates the 1,500 people of the town who were deported to Russia in 1940. And it's not really the answer that the old man is looking for. He actually found out, he knows his mother was one of those 1,500 people. He found that out. 18 years after he left Poland, he'd written a lot of letters trying to find out what had happened to his mum and his dad, and occasionally got a reply, and finally he found out. He wasn't trying to find out whether his mum and dad were alive. He was trying to find a vestige of the town and so he stopped, I'm sure, in front of that first one, and then he moved to the second one. And the second one has got much smaller writing on it, but that smaller writing is names and the ages of people. And it's, there are several hundred names written there. And the date of that is the 20th of January, 1945, which is a couple of months before the war actually came to an end. And what it states is that these inhabitants of the town were murdered by the Wehrmacht, not the Nazis, as they, um, as they retreated. And there he sees the name of the butcher he sees the name of his piano teacher. He sees the names of some of the children who had been his neighbors in the town. He hadn't seen the name of the baker or the baker's daughter. And so he went down the hill and he asked about those people, and that is when he found out what had happened to the half of the town that had been the Jewish population. And the name of the town is Grajevo. It's 
in terms of my own discovery of what happened there, I understand why he couldn't tell me about this, because I only found out about this after he had died. And the thing is, I eventually went to that hill, I climbed up it, and by then, by then, I wasn't looking for my dad anymore. I was actually exploring something else. I was exploring something that I'd become aware had been lit within me because I'd become aware that these stories, those people and their stories had lit within me a flame and a spirit that it's actually wonderful to tell you that I experience it. I think many of you who are here today have a similar light within you that does have to do with Poland. And in terms of that heart, I think all of us can collect that terrible accumulation of events and yet balance that against its the survival of the flame and the spirit and balance it further with the courage that was shown by all of those people and carry it forward individually for a long time. And it's been my great pleasure this afternoon to speak to you of that and I wish you well with that flame within yourselves. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Holden.